Hi everyone. Um, so my name's Robin. Um, I think I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you virtually in uh, in some of the sessions we've had so far, um, and look forward to meeting uh, meeting others of you as the as the week goes on. So this session is sort of fairly interlinked with um, what we've just heard from Ryan. I think Ryan gave us a great introduction to the uh, the murky and dirty world of uh, embodied carbon um and you know set the stage and, and i think provided some some fantastic context what jay and i are going to spend the next 30 minutes 30 to 40 minutes talking about is how we actually um go about doing a um life cycle assessment um it, it is a fairly complex process so we're going to keep things pretty high level and um just kind of walk you through sort of um, the, the the high notes, if you like, of uh, of, of what a, a embodied carbon assessment of a building would look like. Um, we're going to ultimately we'll we'll sort of show you what it might look like for a uh, for the St Lawrence Centre for the Arts. Um, but uh, I'm going to start just by going through um, effectively the key highlights of the methodology that we would follow um, and then uh, and then my colleague Jay um, he's going to talk a bit to uh, we have done some some high level analysis um, of what the embodied carbon impact of the St Lawrence Centre um, for the Arts looks like as it stands and uh, and Jay is going to talk to that and, and share some of the insights that we've gleaned. Um, just before we kick off I'm going to give just a tiny bit of um, background to ourselves. So both myself and Jay are um, graduate students on the uh, Masters of Building Science um, course at, uh, at Toronto Metropolitan. Um, we both come from, uh, should we say, slightly non-traditional backgrounds to this. Um, myself, I um, have spent most of my career to date uh, working, uh, working as an energy analyst um, uh, but so I decided to take a bit of a pivot and um, have uh, started on this um, sustainable buildings uh, route a bit more. Um, and I guess the reason that I'm here today is because my thesis, uh, which is in the uh, final stages of completion, um, is all about embodied carbon. So I've spent essentially the last three to four months studying embodied carbon primarily in um, in new build multi-unit residential buildings in in the GTA uh, looking at how uh, how we what is the embodied carbon of those different types of buildings low rise mid rise high rise and uh, and and what kind of strategies can be used and with that I'm going to jump into it please as always um, it, it it helps you know if we have a uh, you know always keen to sort of have a proactive discussion as we go through so if something's not making sense please shout out put your hand up type something into the uh into the messenger box and, and let's chat about it before going on um but equally we do have time at the end of the session if you want to uh if you want to hold hold back until then um just on that i, I jay are you monitoring the messages in case something comes through i'm not sure i can see it um yes Perfect. okay yeah, we'll let us know Excellent. All right, folks, let's jump into it then. Um, firstly, just a bit of like high level terminology. Uh, we, I think Ryan has just talked to most of this already. We are talking about life cycle assessment here. Um, this is everything, effectively the whole environmental impact, uh, which goes into a building, essentially from the moment that, um, you know, the, the site uh, development starts um, all the way through to um, sourcing of materials, um, construction, transport to site, uh, some stages of the use of, of its building use, um, and then imp increasingly important now is how we uh, demobilize and deconstruct. LCA is a terminology which you'll actually see used throughout multiple industries. So in a building industry, we tend to refer to it as a whole building life cycle assessment. Um, just to distinguish that we're talking about buildings and not a um, particular kind of manufacturing process or type of product. And then, of course, we are looking at embodied carbon, again, which is uh, ultimately represented or traditionally represented in terms of global warming impact. 
and we refer to that either in absolute terms um, or increasingly the carbon intensity um, per meter squared. Okay, so we study embodied carbon through uh, these four steps. I'm gonna jump into each of these four steps in a little bit more detail through this presentation. Um, I guess it's just worth saying here that embodied carbon is a, uh, it's, it's definitely an emerging field of study. Um, there are, and, and consensus is still building within, within the sector around how we do things and what methodologies we follow. Um, what I've presented to you here is presented is codified in international ISO standards, um, but it's pretty high level um, even at this point. So there's a lot of nuances which which may which will probably drop out hopefully as we uh, as we go through the presentation. So first step is to find a goal and scope. Second step is to uh, collect the inventory. Um, that's the official word for um, the building materials. Um, third step is the environmental impact assessment. So how do we work out the actual uh, carbon for each building um, material? And then step four is looking at the results, optioneering, otherwise known as reduction strategies and reporting. Okay, so to, so to define the goal and the scope, uh, select the building, that's hopefully a pretty easy step. Um, and then we get into defining the system boundary and the object of the assessment. The system boundary, um, again, Ryan talked to this just briefly, so I'm not gonna um, go over old ground. The one thing I will say just is that, um, so when, when, when we first started looking at embodied carbon, um, we, we started off just by looking at the, this early, these early phases, what we know as the cradle to gate. So A stage A1 to A3. Um, as Ryan noted, we then, we've increasingly expanded this now to upfront carbon, which is A1 to A5. Um, and then a lot of, uh, or much analysis now is going all the way to what we call cradle to grave, which is A1 all the way through to C4. Um, the reason for the, essentially what's driving this expansion and scope is uh, information. So it's, we know most information about these early product stages. We know least information about how we're going to deconstruct and demobilize a building in 60 years time. Um, if we think how much the world has changed in the last two to three years, trying to make extra, putting a carbon value on how we're going to deconstruct a building in 60 years time is, uh, is, is, is pretty, uh, well, ambitious to say the least. So, uh, so that's why people generally focus on that earlier stage, but we really need to understand all phases to get a true reflection. So to find a system boundary, what stages are we looking at? Second piece is, uh, is the object of assessment. I didn't get a chance to see if Ryan actually covered this or not, but um, essentially what are, when we talk about the object of the assessment, so what are the um, assembly sections of the building that we are looking at because not all are included and again that is due to in many cases that's due to availability of data so we definitely invariably look at footings and foundations we look at the major structure sections we look at the slabs on grade and the structural floors uh, we generally don't look at things like um, electrical mechanical and plumbing um, Firstly, we don't know a huge amount of information about the carbon intensity of these. And secondly, um, these products will turn over many times over a, over a building lifespan. So hopefully you're only ever gonna set one, you're only ever gonna put one set of fo footings and foundations in place for a building over 60 years. Electrical, mechanical, plumbing fixtures, they're gonna turn over two, three times. Um, so it's it's a lot harder to put a carbon intensity value on those. Um, but anyway, typically we're just looking at the major, what we call the superstructure, um, and uh, which we believe is kind of 80 to 90% of the overall carbon intensity. Uh, so that's step one. Step two is to collect the inventory. Um, so here we, effectively this is about getting into the nitty gritty of the building. So. Um, it normally starts with the architectural drawings and we are literally going into um, the, 
the drawings of the building and uh and we, uh, as we call it doing the material takeoffs so we literally go into it and we estimate how much concrete is being used in this slab on grade how much rebar is being used in this footing um how much aluminium is being used in this window wall section um or oh, sorry no we wouldn't do that we'd say how what's the area of the building which is covered by the uh the window wall um this can be a fairly quite a painstaking process to be perfectly honest um the information that we need for so what we need to do is collect the building material data for everything on the in scope on the left hand side everything that we need we have to collect at minimum the building material and the volume um and if we can get information around where the product came from, um, what its lifespan is, uh, anything about the manufacturing process, who manufactured it, that's even greater. Um, we'll then uh, select the EPDs that are going to represent that building material. Ryan just talked to this, so I'm not going to uh, go much more into that. Um, and then we get into step three, which is the environmental assessment. Um, there are multiple number of um, software packages which exist out there which will calculate whole building LCA um, and uh, you know they the reasons for choosing them you know some are free some aren't some have a particular regional focus some have a particular focus on different parts of the building um, so you'll make a decision based on that and then you'll set your modeling parameters there are a whole host of modeling parameters to choose from. Um, I've highlighted a couple of here. What's the building service life? Typically we say it's 60 years. Um, what are the em environmental impact measures? Um, how are we gonna treat biogenic carbon? Um, what's the actual uh, gross internal floor space? Might seem obvious that that's something which is straightforward to calculate, but um, there are multiple definitions of gross floor space. Or gross floor area, um, and uh, and then we input the the data and select the EPDs. I'm just going to briefly talk to a few of these modeling parameters um, in terms of environmental impact measures. So there are many um, which we can model. There are six which are kind of more generally looked at, which are listed out below. To be perfectly honest. The vast majority of analysis just looks at number one the global warming potential um but it is possible to get information on all six if you uh if you so need it biogenic carbon i'm just going to briefly touch on this because this is a fairly uh well it is a contested area right now so biogenic carbon is effectively the carbon that is uh sequestered through um renewable resources such as wood is the obvious one um, through their growth phase. So through the process of photosynthesis, obviously carbon is sequestered, taken out of the atmosphere, and effectively locked away. So putting this into a um, uh, whole building life cycle assessment context, um, you're effectively, you, you effectively can see building materials which sequester carbon as a negative input to um, the LCA process um and uh because they can lock away the carbon for an extended period of timing and in actual fact in in buildings which have a very high timber content it's not completely unknown to find from an lca perspective that they they will actually sequester um almost an equivalent amount of carbon um through the material through the building materials as is um generated by uh, all of the other building materials which are non-sequestering so effectively you have a you have a kind of balance um net zero position uh in reality though um biogenic carbon and the process of sequestration and um how it all work how it all operates is a highly contested area and usually um life cycle assessment will it will calculate the biogenic carbon of a building, but it will not include it in the general results. So you'll often see as a separate column, um, and then it's kind of there for reference, but generally is excluded. 
Um, I, just just uh, in, in case there's kind of a, an additional question there, what's contested about it is questions around like, you know how what happens with wood at the end of life so is it reused is it um is it put in the ground is it you know is it effectively um combusted so there's a lot of um uncertainty around what happens there's questions around um the extent to which wood actually sequesters different types of woods different types of pin uh, timber sequester at different rates um lots of questions around sustainable forests etc cetera, etc cetera. Okay, so then moving on to the um, impact assessment. This is pretty straightforward. You take the, um, so I've got my 100 grams of steel, which I've taken from my material offtakes. I know my um, carbon intensity from my EPD. That gives me a total um, uh, overall embodied carbon, absolute, absolute embodied carbon value. I then effectively sum all of these up and that gives me my building total for the building. And so that gets me to step four. So um, I now have a first set of results. I do, uh, I obviously do the error checking, um, start digging into assessing the results by assembly section, by material, by life cycle stage. Um, I compare to benchmarks um, and I think about reduction strategies. Um, there are just, a, obviously, as always, there are nuances to, to um, to this, which I'm just going to speak to now. Um, a lot of it comes around the benchmarks. So, as I said, again, um, whole building life cycle assessment, it is an emerging field um, where there's still areas where there's not a huge amount of consensus um, about how we should approach different things. So, typically, benchmarking for embodied carbon uh is done one of two ways it's either done through the what i call the baseline building approach or the absolute approach the baseline building approach um which is used in things like lead is where the performance assessment will say okay um develop a baseline building uh, or assume a baseline building um on based on your design calculate the embodied carbon of that and then do it again, um, but demonstrate how your design uh, has a 20% reduction versus the baseline. And, um, and obviously, as you can imagine, that process is not completely um, objective. And it, it places a lot of the um, control in, in, in the lap of the user and uh, as to how you define that baseline how you define that baseline building from which you need to present your apparent reduction. Um, that is leading to shifting to the second type, which is the absolute approach, which is where effectively you have a, um, so the scope of assessment uh, is very clearly defined. Uh, the object of assessment, the life cycle stages. Um, so the methodology is very clearly defined. And then you get to a, um, and, th and then it says, okay, right now, what is your absolute carbon intensity on a meter per, meter per squared basis? Um, and you might see the baseline being some, so the recently released CAGPC uh, version three design has established this baseline of, it has to, in order to, meet this or gain this certification it has to be below 500 kilograms of carbon uh, per meter squared traditionally um the uh the baseline approach has been uh used i think that's in lieu of um you know ba uh you know absolute benchmarks which can be used for an absolute basis but as more is becoming known about this topic and more base and more results are getting out there and being peer reviewed as as you know the work that Ryan is doing, then I think we're going to see a bit more of a shift over to an absolute approach, um, which uh, which should add a bit more sort of robustness to the process. Um, and I think that's about it. I'm uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap here um, on my section. So. Our building life cycle assessment, it, it provides a systematic approach to, um, to 
assessing environmental impact of the building and its and its component parts. What are the carbon intensive parts? Um, as 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 I think uh, you know, Seb was saying on his earlier energy modelling piece. Same goes for whole for whole building life cycle assessments. The outputs are only ever as good as the inputs. Um, so it's a lot of it's you've got to spend time on those inputs, making sure that they're correct. Otherwise, they will skew the results um, really quite significantly. And the same goes for parameters. Um, there's a whole range of inputs and parameters and assumptions which go into these calculations. And it's important to understand what they are before comparing one building to another. So even, you know, uh, comparing similar types, so comparing low rise, mid rise, high rise, you can make the comparison, but they're going to come out with different results. So you need to understand what what's driving those results. Even frankly, you know, a mid rise condo building in in, uh, you know, Toronto versus a mid rise condo building in Miami. They're going to come out the location the climatic conditions are going to mean that those those results are going to come out differently so a lot of it is about understanding ranges of results um, and making sure what you have is in that um, and uh, and just acting with a little bit of caution when comparing and the fourth and final thing is uh whole moon life cycle assessment is an iterative process um, it evolves as new information comes to light. And uh, this is an area where, where we're constantly having to make approximations throughout the whole building industry. We, we make approximations. We, um, we're dealing with, the, with known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And uh, you know, so new information comes to light and it can change results quite significantly. So um, you have to, whenever I'm running these, uh, these these models, I would like to say this, this is a point in time and new information can come to light tomorrow, which can change these results. So, um, yeah, anyway, I think that's that's all from my side. Unless there's any kind of immediate questions right now, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Jay to talk us through the, the next part. Thanks, Robin. Um, so Robin's presented the, the, the steps in the process. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a sort of high level uh, example calculation for the St. Lawrence Center. Um, so the first thing, if we go to the next slide, please. First thing that we, that Robin mentioned is we need to figure out the building. Well, that's the St. Lawrence Center, that one's easy. Um, the St. Lawrence Center, if something is put in its place, will be uh, required to adhere to Toronto Green Standard version four, tier two, for the for, since it's a city building, um, that document outlines the scope that we need to be concerned with the structure, with foundations and footings, uh, the horizontal elements, the floor slabs, the roofs, the ground floor slab, uh, and stairways. So this building, um, we want to we want to come up with a. Uh, estimation of what the embodied carbon is in the existing building, just so that we know what it is that we're working from. <clears throat> it was built somewhere in the late 60s, open in the early 70s, to my knowledge. Um, that being the case, the documents that we have to work with are essentially just the drawings. Uh, there are a couple of DWG files, which essentially reflect the same thing. There's, there's not a great deal of value added from them from uh, my perspective as I went through this. The second most important resource that I could find is the actual building itself because as I'll mention in a minute sometimes you're going to encounter issues with the drawings. So it for an existing building it's very helpful to be able to go on site to walk through the building and sometimes to even actually uh, measure things out and then confirm with the drawings. Um, if you've ever seen a drawings package for a building like this, it is usually large. Um, the, the documents that I find the, the most useful for material quantities determinations 
are the structural drawings. Um, so these are typically labeled, you know, S1, S2, and so forth. Um, the problems that you can encounter though, sometimes you're going to be missing documents. Sometimes those documents are incomplete. Uh, in this situation, I think there are three or four pages worth of structural drawings where only half of them or a third of them were scanned. That can be an issue. It can be, make, make life a little more challenging. Um, some other things that you'll find, sometimes the documents are difficult to read. There are some sections that are kind of faded out. So uh, they may also be just missing information. Uh, and then in a situation like this where you're, you're reaching back you know, 50 years, you may encounter different conventions in, in the drawings and the markings. Um, in, in another building that I've, I'm working on, uh, the, the structural, uh, structural engineers that uh, are helping me de decipher the drawings um, have mentioned that uh, their experience is from London at the same time that these, these documents were drawn. So the conventions in them are just slightly different. So sometimes there's a little bit of interpretation that needs to occur between them. Uh, okay, if we can go to the next one. Three minutes, okay. Um, so what we've done here is we've pulled out an example of how to do one of these calculations for some caissons beneath the north northeast wall. And you can see those outlined in the left in red. Fortunately, in this drawing set, there is a schedule for the caissons, which tells us that these are 30 inches in diameter. And it gives us some other, other information about the uh, height of the top of the caissons versus uh, the datum on the, uh, the site. What we can do from this is we can pull a, a volume for the concrete in this caisson. You know, we, we know the area, uh, the height for the caisson, we'll, we'll call it 10, 10 feet. Um, we can pull some of this information off some of the other drawings. Uh, if we do the calculation, turn the crank, that says that we have 0 0.708 cubic meters worth of concrete. Next problem is, what kind of concrete are we dealing with? Next chart, please. So the concrete note on chart S4 tells us that we have 3000 PSI concrete, which we just so happen to look into the one-click software and find that we've got a, an EDP, a generic EDP for 3000 pound PSI uh, concrete which is great, matches up. Since this is a 50 year old building and there was not a focus on carbon intensity when it was built, we can probably assume that this was not the most environmentally friendly process. Therefore, out of the multiple EPDs that were available, I chose one that was not so great in terms of its environmental rating. And next. So what do we do with this? Here's a, an example of the foundations and substructure category in the one-click software. Now over on the left, that gray bar at the bottom that's highlighted, you can see ready mix concrete, 3000 PSI. We had six of these caissons in that one area at that one, <clears throat> at that one volume mentioned for a total of 4.2 cubic meters worth of concrete. The CO2 equivalent co column tells us that we're generating 2.4 tons of CO2 from that. So those are your A stages, your, your raw materials. Then the next column, transport A4, that's the delivery to the site. That's the, the actual distance the concrete truck is traveling. And then over here on the extreme right, you can see the uh, repairs per year, the B3 segment, and that gives us a repair metric. So 
you do you you will create one of these for each of the features in your building. Um, I've only talked about the concrete here. The next feature you'd want to consider too in this situation it would be reinforcing. So you have to go in, find the appropriate steel that was used, find something that's equivalent in the APDs, add that in. In the end, the software will sum all of this up and produce your, your value. Uh, next chart, please. So the Canada Green Building Council zero building, zero carbon building standard tells us that we need to produce results based on the life cycle analysis stages A through D if possible, as well as break that down into the various building assemblies. So next. So here we go. Um, broken down by the, the phase, we can see that the dominant phase overall is the A1 through A3 phase. This is the, uh, the upfront carbon area. Uh, and this, if you remember back to Ryan's talk, he said that the, the, uh, the upfront embodied carbon is about three quarters of the building process. And sure enough, that's what this reflects as well. Um, this analysis does not consider operational carbon. Uh, I don't have the, the data to do that since it is a, an historic building. We could probably uh, contact the TO Live folks and pull that information if we have more time. Um, 10 more minutes now, okay. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next chart, please. So here we're breaking it down by the various uh, features of the building. And we can see that the horizontal elements have the greatest impact on the embodied carbon, the, the GWP. Um, next come the, the walls. And then the third most are the, is the structure of the building itself. Um, so what we can do at this point is use this as our baseline building. And we can come back in and start to make decisions and trade-offs for different materials or different processes to help reduce the amount of, of uh, CO2 equivalent going into the building. So in this case, for instance, uh, concrete floor slabs, one option might be, you know, use less concrete. And how do you do that? Well, we can add, put additives into the concrete, which will reduce the amount of concrete mix that goes in or the amount of concrete that goes into the mix. We can add, put in other additives, things like bubble deck, uh, which will create voids in the concrete, yet still keep it structurally sound. Another option that we could take is we can switch materials entirely. Um, one typical plan for buildings is to build, say the first floor or first couple of floors in concrete to get the building up off the ground and away from the water and then build the rest of the structure in something like wood, mass timber. Um, mass timber has a lower carbon footprint than the concrete. So overall, the, the upper structures will decrease the amount of carbon in the project. Um, the other thing that LCA can help do for you uh, in these situations is that it can help you make choices for repair and replacement. Um, so, you can do trade-offs between the products that you're putting into the building, say windows or doors, and you can look at the, the various environmental impacts, but you can also look at things like the manufacturer specified repair lifetime uh, as to how long that they, they estimate that product will last. And then the fewer replacements that need to be done over the lifetime of the building, the savings for the building owner, as well as the savings for the environment. Uh, and next chart, please. So Robin mentioned uh, that there are other impact measures that the Tracy standard uh, from Environmental Protection Agency in the US specifies. And uh, this is just to show the software will kick out those numbers for each of those different impacts. And 
Next slide. So the LCA process can overall help reduce the environmental impact of the buildings and the products that go into it. And it can also help you to provide an informed uh, decision-making process at the time that the, the building is being designed and built. Um, and this can take place everything from the macro level, the entire building and site, all the way down to the micro level as to, for instance, uh, which doors and windows to install. Uh, and I guess that's it. If we go to the next slide, take Q&A at this point. And Robin, I'm not sure, can you see any, any chat windows or are you, you blind like me? I am blind. Okay, so okay. go ahead and uh, either raise your hand or uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and otherwise I guess Bettina will, will call out the questions as they come <laughs> through the chat. <laughs> Yeah, so Ben Brown's just saying what a great analysis. And I just want to add thank you both <laughs> for volunteering to do this. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it, it seems incredibly complicated. It, who who does this work? Like, is it, are you, would you be within an architectural firm? Would it be a separate consulting firm within an engineering firm? Who would you hire to do this? Um, well, I mean, I, I guess Ryan is a great example. He, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he does it through his consulting firm. Um, I think it's something which, so I, I think there's a few, there's a few aspects to it. One is there, there is a, I guess, like environmental building consultants um, uh, will, will do it. Um, but I think I'm, uh, you know, through my work and discussions, I, I've seen increasingly, I think people are getting interested in it from the architectural end. They obviously they are um, the, it's the architects who are right in it in there at the beginning and um, I think one obvious takeaway which has probably been made several points several times already is that in, embodied carbon um, uh, decisions are most impactful at that very early stage so uh, it's at that kind of early design stage where you can actually make make the biggest impact so. Um, uh, that's a roundabout way of saying I think uh, yeah architects are either maybe the big ones that are looking at it in-house um, or certainly it's a lot more on their radar um, and uh, but it's interesting you know like in my uh, research on this um, the EPDs EPD process it's 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 not cheap for for by by any means it, it's an expensive process for a manufacturer to get EPD um, certification um you know uh so it's certainly not I, I, it's not that surprising that you know it tends to be the bigger players which are doing it but what i am noticing is that it is um you know it is it is definitely getting more information out there and perhaps some some suppliers working in producing certain products which may have a um, high carbon intensity um, generally, but their products, or they may be looking to differentiate themselves with a uh, lower carbon intensity product. They will they see the EPD almost as a kind of almost like as a marketing opportunity um, to you know demonstrate the uh, their, the 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 performance of their product. So um, I think you're seeing seeing it. In terms of the whole building life cycle assessment, that's going to tends to be at the kind of early stage. But manufacturers are increasingly looking at it, um, uh, you know, from the EPD angle as well. So um, it's uh, it's an emerging picture. Terrific. And Hakan is asking, what are the other softwares used to calculate embodied carbon? Um, I, I, I don't know, I must admit, I'm not sure um, if right the extent to which Ryan covered this, but um, just off the top of my head, so one click LCA is the best known out there in the industry. It is, it, it is a subscription process um, service and it's not particularly cheap. Um, so not everyone has the luxury of that. 
Um, uh, free options. Uh, there's a great one called Athena, which is used, uh, which also has a great Canadian slant on things. Um, so that that's a good option. Um, there's, uh, there's Beam. Uh, yeah, Beam is Beam. for um, for low rise residential. Yeah, low rise residential. There's a new one again, free, which has just come out called Beam, uh, which is great yeah. for kind of family home size. Uh, also I don't know developed what, what else in Canada. Can... Um, I think there's one tally. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, that's that's a good point actually. And then there's various another angle that has been come out from this is through um, basically plugins to existing um, uh, software, which is widely used. So I think yeah. it's Tally, which plugs into Revit. Maybe um, obviously Revit is very widely used in certain sections of the construction industry. So. Um, uh, yeah, some of them involved on so. Fabulous. Uh, Malika is asking, what's the first step to calculate embodied carbon of the built environment? And you're also getting lots of comments. So, sorry, can you just say that again? Yeah, my apologies. What is the first step to calculating embodied carbon of the built environment? Uh, well, I mean, um, I, I think we've we've sort of touched on on most of the steps, but I mean, yeah, like understanding your building, I, I think getting a good understanding of your building, uh, what's included in it, what type of building is it, um, understanding the baseline, um, and uh, and then obviously selecting the software, get, getting getting familiar with the architectural drawings or, or, or your material source would be, is, is a good one as well. Yeah, and you've got, you've got to figure out early on what it is that you're assessing because you look when you look at those drawings there are, there are lots of little details in there and uh, you, you can't possibly go through not not in a in easily measurable amount of time uh and, and perform calculations for all of it at once it, it is definitely would be an iterative process in that sense 